This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Christians and Israelis work together to fight BDS. Plus, meet a Holocaust survivor saved by Oscar Schindler, and dozens of American Jewish youth come to join the IDF. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl filling in for Chris Mitchell. The Lutheran Church has become the latest American denomination to join the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against Israel. In an attempt to fight back against BDS, about a hundred Christian leaders and Israeli Knesset members are working together. Serving in the IDF is not the only way of being a soldier for Israel. Israel's safety and well-being are the responsibility of every Jew, of every Christian who loves Israel in every place, and at every moment of life. Joseph Sabag of the Israel Allies Foundation is spearheading the effort to push for legislation in the United States to fight the BDS movement against Israel. In May of 2015, South Carolina became the first state in America to adopt modern legislation regulating against the problem of commercial discrimination and boycotts against Israel. Since then, a dozen additional states have also taken action. The BDS movement focuses its campaign on Israeli companies operating in the West Bank, which encompasses Biblical Judea and Samaria. Ironically, this affects Palestinians greatly because when Israeli companies move, Palestinians lose good-paying jobs. Critics say the BDS movement isn't about justice or helping the Palestinians. The danger of BDS is that uh, Israel will lose its le a bit legitimacy to defend itself and ultimately lose its legitimacy to exist as a Jewish and sovereign state. Our enemies understand this very well. What the, is going on with BDS as a global name for all the Israel haters is really the misinformation campaign that they're feeding to the general public and the miseducation that's going on on the campuses. Barry Shaw, author of BDS for Idiots, said it's simple. The reason they're protesting only against the Jewish state and not the Arab states and regimes that abuse the Palestinians they profess to help is simply because Israel is the Jewish state. That's no more or no less than blatant anti-Semitism. Shaw says if these BDSers were honest, their boycotts would include Israeli technology, like the Israeli components in their own computers, laptops, and cell phones. But they need these to communicate their lies and the false narratives to their supporters and to the general public. Knesset member and former diplomat Michael Oren sees only one way to combat lies. We beat terror through a combination of, uh, of steadfastness and very good intelligence. We beat terror. Um, but there's only one true uh, defense uh, and one effective weapon against delegitimization and that is the truth. The BDS movement is proof that not all of Israel's enemies have guns and suicide vests. John Waggy shows us how this economic war is being fought on the college campuses, in the courts, and even in churches in America. When Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat tried to address a group of students at San Francisco State last week, he was shouted down by members of the anti-Israel BDS movement. It stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, and it's a powerful coalition of groups waging an economic and cultural war against Israel. This Stand With Us conference in Los Angeles is an effort to counter the BDS movement, to fight the deluge of anti-Israel hostility on college campuses and social media and in the global economy. Shir, an Israeli student, was shouted down and called a war criminal while she was speaking at a university in Tampa. They waited be, uh, outside of the class and we had to have a police escort to our cars because they kept following us and calling us names. And how can you sleep at night? You are, um, you are a murderer. It really, it really hurts. As you can see, I'm standing here. I'm, I'm a civilized human being. I'm not a war machine. Alone is a former Israeli soldier. He says he's constantly challenged by rumors and half-truths about Israel by his foreign friends on social media. He was also shouted down on campus by BDS supporters. Standing up, shouting, screaming, not even having an open discussion, just throwing out comments in the air, 
without any open dialogue. No, it's freedom of speech for me, but not for thee. That is what is the mantra of the BDS supporters on college campuses. San Diego attorney Mika Danzig does pro bono work for people threatened by the BDS movement. He's angered that the freest society in the Middle East is singled out with the help of serial human rights abusers in the rest of the world. And you're saying the one Jewish state is so deserving of this, then you uniquely attribute all this evil to the one Jewish state. That can't help but spill over to Jews on campus. It can't help but spill over to Jewish businesses, to people who are supportive of Israel, to Zionists, non-Jewish Zionists, Christian Zionists who support Israel. They become the focus of this vitriol and hate, not just Israel. Several mainline Protestant churches are involved in the BDS economic war on Israel. The push began in the United Nations, targeting Israel for divestment in the same way churches targeted apartheid South Africa in the 1980s. Stand With Us CEO Roz Rothstein says some church leaders have bought into a campaign of disinformation that distorts the true picture in the Middle East. Because oftentimes it's not the people in the pews that, that are angry at Israel. It's the people in leadership positions that are, that are moving in this direction and, and on false information, on half-truths. Rothstein says she's thankful for the millions of Christians who do support Israel. I'm a daughter of Holocaust survivors, and I am personally grateful to the community for standing shoulder to shoulder with the state of Israel and Jewish people on these very difficult issues during these BDS campaigns, so thank you. John Waggy, CBN News, Los Angeles. Coming up, meet a real-life Holocaust survivor from Schindler's List. Welcome back to Jerusalem Dateline. Schindler's List stands as one of the most moving films of all time. The movie shows how Oscar Schindler saved nearly 1,200 Jews during the Holocaust. As Chris Mitchell reports, Christian leaders recently met one of Schindler's survivors during a seminar at the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, Yad Vashem. At the end of Schindler's List, made in 1993, the survivors placed stones of remembrance on his grave in Jerusalem. Today, Eva Ratz is one of those survivors. As a young child in 1945, she was number 201 on Schindler's List. Her mother, Fella, was number 202. Every time I come here, I am very moved, really, because he's my survivor. They ask me in Poland, how did you survive the Holocaust? I say, first of all, the Almighty God, second, my mother, and third, of course, Oscar Schindler. Rats addressed Christian leaders at the gravesite. I loved Mr. Schindler, her director. All of us loved him, an angel of mercy, really. We knew exactly what he's doing and how difficult it is to to do it. Rats later told the group about surviving the Holocaust and life in the camp before she met Schindler. The Germans were terrible. 25 lashes on, on the behind was every day. They uh, hang people in the apple plots every two days. There was no reason. I think that Hitler and the Nazism really convinced them that really they, they are not human. These Christian leaders came as part of a seminar hosted by Yad Vashem and the Museum of the Bible. Yad Vashem here in Jerusalem is dedicated to preserving the memory of the Holocaust for future generations. It's also committed to educate this present generation about the dangers of anti-Semitism and remaining silent in the face of evil. We think about the Holocaust, the church was silent. We don't have to be silent today. Susanna Kokanen leads the seminar for Christian leaders. This seminar is for Christian leaders to learn about anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, and Israel today. When we think about anti-Semitism, we used to think about it in the past. But now, in the past few years, we have seen how much it's rising all over the world. So we understand that suddenly this topic is very urgent, and it's really important for church leaders to understand what's happening. The 10-day seminar had a deep impact on the visiting Christian leaders. I would say this seminar has been a life-changing experience. It has been a stretch spiritually, intellectually, emotionally. Uh, has really impacted my view of the history of the Jewish people. To 
be here in the land to meet the people, to meet the survivors. It's been quite a moving experience. Pastor Josh Phillips plans to take home a new passion. A love for, for Israel and, and the Jewish people that I, I didn't know I had, I didn't know I needed, uh, but, but uh, a desire to be a partner and a, an advocate uh, for Israel, for the Jewish people. Yet Coconut believes much of the church is still silent. I see the silence of the church. Um, we are silent about anti-Semitism. Most of us don't really feel that it touches us. We might say that it's awful, it's terrible, it's wrong, but we don't need to take any concrete steps. And that same conspiracy of silence also exists with regard to persecution of the Christians. Today we're in the same boat. Christians and Jews. More Christians are being murdered every day than Jews throughout the Middle East and other places. We need each other. There is a clash of civilizations. Yad Vashem's Ephraim K sees world events forging a bond between Jews and Christians. We both have to work together because this is something that affects us all. And we have to know what the dangers are in fundamentalist, radical, extremist Islam. Evil cannot be overlooked, especially after the Holocaust. And he sees the value of these seminars. When we come in contact with these evangelical pastors, it gives us hope. Israelis, as Jews living here in the Middle East, we're in a tough neighborhood, it's not easy, but they give us a lot of support, a lot of optimism, which is important. And they embrace us and we embrace them. It couldn't be better. Ratz agrees. I want that everyone will know what Schindler was. Schindler was not a Jew. He was a Christian, and I'm sure that many Christians, maybe they will do the same. I believe in the Christians. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Yad Vashem, Jerusalem. Coming up, can Germany handle all the Middle Eastern refugees they're now absorbing? Welcome back. From Germany past to Germany present, German Chancellor Angela Merkel famously told Germans that their country can handle millions of refugees, but the reality has proven to be very different, and one voice is warning of a dark future. Dale Hurd brings us that story from Germany. Five attacks in two weeks, most with some connection to immigration, and more attacks on the horizon. It has a lot of Germans wondering what Angela Merkel, with her open-door refugee policy, has done to Germany. It's not safe, not more in Germany. Is it really more danger or not? But it feels more danger. I'm a little bit afraid because uh, the terror comes uh, nearer to us. I have a little bit of fear. Some say Angela Merkel's political fate was sealed when she threw open Germany's doors to more than a million migrants and told the German people that we can do this. And now the approval rating for the woman who was once one of the most popular chancellors in post-war Germany has collapsed. Terrorism has now become a part of life in a nation that used to see very little. Almost daily, terror attacks across Western Europe have an entire continent on edge. This is what happened in the Balkan nation of Kosovo when someone shouted ISIS as a joke, a stampede that injured 40 people. A lot of Germans warned that Merkel was bringing disaster with her refugee policy, including the woman who awoke a lot of Germans to the threat of Islam, Heidi Munt, also known as the brave German woman. This video of Heidi interrupting the call to prayer by a Muslim imam in a German cathedral went viral on the internet. Now, after the flood of mostly Muslim refugees into Germany, Heidi Munt says she believes some German leaders want to destroy the nation. I am really convinced that there are bad people of darkness who want to destroy us. They are servants of the devil. They are sick in their opinion. And they don't care if uh, it will cost lives or not. It will be bloody or not, you know. They want to destroy, they want to take over. And before the terrorism that hit Germany, before the New Year's Eve sex attacks in Cologne and other cities, Heidi says God spoke to her about Germany's future. Yes, uh, God gave me a vision over the border of uh, Germany and uh, Europe. And uh, he gave it to me two times in the last, last years. And I saw um, a 
human prayer chain standing around Germany and praying for Germany and for Europe. I spoke out, out a warning uh, for, for, first to my brothers and sisters in Christ uh, that we have to pray against this uh, raping uh, which would come up. I told them that we would face danger, yeah, and especially our, our children, our girls, our women. She sent the warning to her followers on Facebook, and because of that, Munt was reported and investigated by the local prosecutor for hate speech. Then what she warned of came true. Germany is now in the grips of what some are calling a rape epidemic. The hate speech investigation against Heidi has been dropped. It was not hate speech, and uh, I don't have hatred in my heart. No, I love my people, and I also love those people who are coming in. Uh, I wanted to open the eyes of the people that they could understand what's going on. Heidi Munt feels she knows Angela Merkel because both grew up under communism in the former East Germany. Merkel was the daughter of a Protestant pastor. But Heidi Munt has harsh words for Germany's chancellor. Who is Merkel? I am sorry, who is she? I have been a communist. I know who she is. For me, she's a wolf. And people think she's a Christian. She would not destroy her country. She would not destroy the people here. And she is doing it right now. Germany is still under the control of political correctness that casts the opponents of immigration as Nazis and racists. The third largest political party in Germany now is the right-wing alternative for Germany. One of its leaders is Bjorn Herke. I only know that Chancellor Angela Merkel is throwing our country into disaster, and with us also Europe. Herke says he still considers Germany a Christian nation because of its Christian foundation. And he said Germany cannot integrate millions of Muslims because Islam is a religion that is stuck in the Middle Ages. But the growing popularity of alternative for Germany does not mean the nation is close to a turnaround. Merkel has doubled down on her refugee program, attacking opponents. Heidi Munt believes the future for Germany is chaos and war. But she would not say it is too late. The question, is it too late? I will tell you when it's too late. It's too late when God has given us up. Then it's too late. Dale heard CBN News, reporting from Germany. Up next, Fulfilling Prophecy, Jews return to their ancient homeland. Welcome back. 75 young Jewish Americans and Canadians arrived in Israel with the goal of joining the Israel Defense Forces. They were among 233 new immigrants from the U.S. and Canada that flew into Tel Aviv on a chartered flight by Nefesh Benefesh. Here's what some of the newcomers told CBN News about their experience. I came to live the dream in Israel. It's like something I've dreamed about doing since I was seven years old. I think Israel has a right to be a country and I want to do what I can to make sure that it stays a country as long as possible. I feel like Israel has a need for the IDF. The IDF is absolutely indispensable to the continued existence of the state of Israel. It has one of the most difficult jobs in the world, but it has one of the most honorable missions. I am upset that I left my family and I had to leave everything that's comfortable to me, but it's for something bigger than I am. I went to Poland and I saw the concentration camps, I saw the ghettos, and I was like, it became so much more real to me. And like my purpose for coming to the army, I think, is that I want to help protect the one place that I know, God forbid it ever happens, there's a place that's safe for the Jewish people. There's a feeling of belonging here that like, you really don't have anywhere else, uh, and I just couldn't see myself like spending the rest of my life in any other place, so I'm here. Israel makes me the best person I can be, and I always want to be here and move with my husband and our new baby. And I feel blessed. Yeah. Hashem is great. It's been a long time. It's been about 48 years that I've wanted to live here. It's our destiny. We're Jewish. America's wonderful, fantastic country. I love it. But we're visitors there. We're, we belong here. As we've seen, a growing number of Jews are returning to Israel. It's part of a fulfillment of prophecy spoken in the Bible. Charlene Aaron spoke with the head of one organization on the front lines, helping the Jews make their way home. Seeing Jewish people return to Israel is literally watching Bible prophecy unfold. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel all speak of the Jewish return to the land. It says several times in Isaiah, 
I will lift up a banner to the nations, to the Gentiles. They shall bring your sons and your daughters back. Deborah Minotti heads Operation Exodus, an organization that helps Jews return to their biblical homeland. She says since 2014, there's been a 79% increase of inquiries about assistance to return to Israel. If I can just give glory to God because this is His work. In 1948, Israel had 800,000 Jewish people in the land when they became a nation in one day, like Isaiah said. Now there's over 6 million. So that is incredible, over 67 years. And so they're going back, I, the plane loads yearly. Operation Exodus partners with the Jewish Agency for Israel and other groups to help Jews move to Israel. The organization also provides humanitarian aid to Holocaust survivors and others in the former Soviet Union. A big part in helping those seeking to return is the power of prayer. We pray for their safety. We also pray that they would get jobs quickly. And those things that are holding them back here, the frustrations, you know, there's family issues that are going on, children who are sick. Minotti says there are many reasons Jews are returning to their homeland. Many of them are saying, Hashem is calling us back to the land. Others are saying, I want my children to be raised in a Jewish homeland. Other ones are saying, I want to defend Israel. I want to be there. I'm a Zionist. They say this is 1939, some of them. They say that we see the handwriting on that wall. Motivated by love for Israel and for the Jewish people, Operation Exodus offers Minati and others the opportunity to work with God to bring his prophecies to pass. You wake up and you think, what an awesome responsibility and what an awesome joy it is at the same time. It is deep joy. And there's a cost to standing with Israel. So um, it is, it's intense, but I love it. I love it. And our workers love it. Our volunteers love it. It's only, it's only going to grow. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. That's it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.